So, um, hello everyone, and thank you, uh, Monshin Sensei, for the introduction. Yes, I am talking from Ottawa, and it is also a sauna uh, in here uh, lately. It's been like that. Uh, and today's presentation, I'm excited to hear that Mochin Sensei is excited to to hear about the presentation that's on precepts. Now I just hope that I'm going to do justice to the expectations. Um, for those who don't know me, uh, my name is Maxim Marcotte Boutier. Uh, I have a PhD in political science from York University in Toronto, uh, Canada. And uh, my PhD actually consisted of translating classical Japanese Buddhist texts um, and come up with a political theory around that. Um, so a lot of the talks that I do tend to focus on some of the translations that, I, that I've done, which part of what we're going to be talking about today is going to include some of these trans translations. Uh, but yeah, today's topics is on the precepts more specifically. Uh, and I always appreciate the opportunity to come here and be able to do these talks. And I also very much like the conversations that oftentimes spurs, you know, spreads after the talk. So please feel free to ask. Any questions or even, you know, send me emails or something after um, I, I like to take the time when I can to respond to these, even though I'm not great at responding at emails, but I try. OK, so today um, presentation is on the precepts. So the structure of the talk is going to look like this. Uh, so just a short history of precepts in Buddhism and then kind of overall uh, way. It's going to be very short. It's I'm not going to do justice to everything that needs to be said about this. Uh, I want to focus a bit on the Brahmajala Sutra, which is a sutra that's very important for Japanese Buddhism, and Tendai has a very important role in history re re regards to that sutra. Um, so we're going to talk a bit about the, the history of the context behind the text, as well as the core of the presentation is going to go through uh, the precepts. So there's, as we're going to see, there's like 10 major precepts and 48 minor uh, I'm actually going to go through the 10 major precepts literally one by one as they are translated into the BDK uh, translation is the one I'm going to be using for the text. It's available on BDK America's website. Uh, you can download the PDF for free. Uh, so for anybody who is interested in reading more about the different precepts and the, the whole context of that book, um, it's available for free as PDF or you can buy it. Then we're gonna. I'm gonna bring in a bunch of quotes from Asai that talks on precepts because Asai had a lot to say about precepts specifically. It's very important to him, so I decided to focus on this author specifically and what he has to say about it. And lastly, just ended up on are precepts still important to us in modern times? So to start, um, when we talk about precepts. Um, the Pali word is sila, Sanskrit word is shila, and the Japanese is kai or shira. So shira is like the uh, the the transliteration of the Sanskrit of the Pali. Um, and you have the kanji that are there too. So generally speaking, what we when we talk about um, the precepts, we talk about uh, like character, conduct, behavior. That's the more kind of translation. But because when we talk about character or behavior or habit, it usually refers to good conduct or moral conduct. And because of that, in English, we do translate it as virtue, morality, ethics, or discipline, etc. So the Vinaya is a word that means to lead or to guide or something like that. But oftentimes when we talk about Vinaya, we refer to Buddhist texts that contain the rules or precepts for the monastic community. Uh, they are There's a total of 227 rules of conduct for ordained monks and 311 for ordained nuns. So according to the traditional perspective, uh, the precepts are said to have been initially developed about 13 years after the Buddha's enlightenment. At first, the precepts were not needed because the Sangha consisted of a few people that were almost enlightened. But as the Sangha expanded to include more and more people, including lay practitioners, the community switched to be mendicant based. And therefore, a new set of principles needed to be established to fit in within that new reality. And that's when the precepts were created, at least according to the traditional history. Now, the complete Vinaya Pitaka, which is the, the Vinaya text, uh, was said to be recited by Upali, which is one of the 
let's say, top 10 disciples of the Buddha. Uh, and it was recited during the first council, which happened shortly after the Buddha's death. And apparently the Buddha had said that the Sangha could abolish the minor precepts after his passing, but the council decided to keep them. And the precepts that we have is the result of uh, this person remi remembering uh, the precepts and saying them uh, out loud during the first um, council. So that is for the short history of the precepts in general uh, in the Buddhist tradition as a whole. Now, with regards to the text, the Brahma Jala Sutra specifically, uh, it's Bon Mo Kyo in Japanese. You also have, I think the longer name is Brahma Jala Bodhisattva Sila Sutra or Bon Mo Bosatsu Kaikyo in Japanese. Um, this is like the, the smaller renditions. So it is the primary Vinaya text that articulates a set of precepts specifically from a Mahayana Buddhist perspective. So it targets Bodhisattva practitioners. The origins of the text are obscure, like many other sutras. Um, one set of researchers claimed that the text was written in Sanskrit in India and made its way to China and was translated into Chinese by Kumarajiva in the early 400s. Another set of researchers claimed that it is written uh, in the, 14, the 400s, again, but using various Mahayana and Hinayana writings who were available at the time and adding to them a layer that is a moral perspective that is distinctively Chinese. And the text does not consist only of the precepts. Uh, it's actually split in two fascicles or two chapters. Um, the first one discusses the 40 Mahayana stages and the second fascicle, it actually presents the, the principles, uh, sorry, the precepts. For the purpose of this presentation, I will focus only on the second fascicle, the one that talks about the precepts, because that is what we're dealing with today. So in the original Vinaya precepts, only the first five grave precepts need to be followed by lay practitioners. However, the 10 major precepts of the Brahma Jala Sutra are said to be useful guidelines for the laity and the monastic community alike. So it is generally agreed upon in scholarship that the Brahma Jala Sutra was developed at a moment where a clearer and more realistic set of rules needed to be implemented for people who do not become monk, uh, while at the same time adapt the precepts to reflect a new, more Mahayana perspective. In that sense, the Bodhisattva precepts, which is one of the names that we talk about, the, the precepts that are laid out in this text, sometimes they're called Mahayana precepts, sometimes they're called Bodhisattva precepts. Uh, I'm going to use them interchangeably throughout the presentation. So the Bodhisattva precepts tend to focus more on the intentionality of the act or the person's enjoyment of a particular act rather than the act itself. There are also different rules with which regards to how a person can receive the precepts. So, for example, in the traditional Vinaya setting, a specific number of efficient and witnesses need to be there in uh, when someone receives the ordination. But with the Bodhisattva precepts, a practitioner could receive them through, for example, uh, like a vision of the Buddha, for example, or through uh, an extended period of repentance. And this also, at least researchers think, that this also reflects the intent of making the precepts be adapted to the reality of a society where monastic communities were either new or non-existent at all, or where qualified people that could give ordination were extremely rare. So in that sense, we can think of the Brahma Jala Sutra as a kind of modernization of the precepts, but a modernization of thousands of years ago to reflect the more realistic needs of societies that grew to become different than that when the Buddha lived, or at least shortly after he lived. Now, with regards to Tendai, or Tendai um, the text is important. First of all, Zuyi, which is the person that wrote the uh, Mohotsikwan, the Makashikan in Japanese. Uh, so Zuyi wrote commentaries on the Brahma Jala Sutra, uh, and that in itself helped propel the text to the level of a canonical scripture, scripture from Mahayana Buddhism 
in China because Ziyi wrote about it. Then other people kind of picked it up and wrote commentaries on Ziyi's commentaries, etc. So a lot more text started to be written on that text specifically, and it kind of like make it become one of the core uh, texts of Mahayana Buddhism. But more closely related to, to us, um, Saicho, which is the founder of Tendai Buddhism in Japan, uh, petitioned the Japanese emperor to establish a distinctively Mahayana ordination platform for Japanese Buddhism based on this sutra specifically. So as we were kind of saying earlier, uh, if you would do ordination in the traditional Vinaya setting, you would have the, you know, 2000, uh, sorry, 200 ish for monks and 311 for nuns. And you would have to follow them thoroughly and it would have to be happening through a particular setting. So Saicho was like, well, for Japan, we're going to like not do the traditional Vinaya setting. We're going to actually use the precepts of this text to build the monastic community. And when you take ordination, you, you take them through these Mahayana precepts or the Bodhisattva precepts rather than the traditional Vinaya. So uh, this text is incredibly important for not just Japanese Buddhism, but Tendai more specifically. Now, when I talk about the precepts in the text, there are 58 precepts in total. So I've already alluded to the 10 major precepts, Jujukai in Japanese. Uh, so these ones are the monastic community must follow these 10 precepts, but also it is uh, the guideline for lay practitioners. As I have alluded to earlier, um, the lay practitioner in the traditional Vinaya setting trying to only have like five to follow, but in this concept, they also uh, have a guideline to follow the first 10, uh, which are considered the major precepts. But there is also 48 minor precepts. Uh, and these are like, I won't get in trouble for this, but it's the kind of like, you don't have to follow them, but if you do, it really helps you advance on the Bodhisattva path. So the more of these precepts you're able to follow, the quicker your ascension to Bodhisattvahood is going to happen, or at least maybe not quicker, but at least uh, better, like in terms of quality kind of thing. So there's 58 in total. The more you're able to follow, the better. Uh, in a nutshell, but at least the 10 major are the ones that you should really try to follow as much as possible. Okay, so the next part of the presentation is I'm going to dig through uh, the 10 major precepts one by one. I'm going to read exactly how it's been translated in the BDK translation. Um, I won't be able to comment on the translation because I haven't read the text in 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 Chinese or Japanese. So uh, I'm going to rely on the translation being somewhat accurate for now. But if someone knows, please uh, feel free to comment on it at the end. So the first one is prohibition of killing for pleasure. I also note the uh, on the on the left side of your screen the the Japanese uh, writing for the precept. Also, just to note, uh, just a bit of a side note. These, uh, either the Japanese writing or the title, like Prohibition of Killing for Pleasure, these are not found in the original text. Uh, the only thing you have is the actual text of like what you don't do or what you do or like these kinds of things. The titles of each uh, are not there. They've been added later, either in commentaries or um, or even in modern times. Um, and I think a uh, there's a commentary from a Korean monk, like, you know, thousands of years ago that established these. And I think we've been following them ever since. So for the first one, it basically says, if you yourself kill, or if you incite someone else to kill, or you participate in the planning of a killing, or praise killing, or enjoy seeing someone kill, or kill by magical spells, then you have the causes of killing, the conditions of killing, the method of killing, the act of killing, this holds true even for the accidental killing. So in any way you're connected to killing whatsoever, you you hold on to, I guess, like the, the, the karmic weight, if you want, of being attached to killing in any form or shape. Instead, bodhisattvas, which is the title used to describe a people that are following the precepts. So when he said bodhisattvas, it's not just like like actual bodhisattvas. It's like the, the title for any of us that is part of the communities, uh, the, of the Mahayana community. So bodhisattvas should give rise to an enduring attitude of compassion, an attitude of reverence and obedience, and devise skillful means to save and protect all sentient beings. 
So instead of doing this, you would do this uh, to follow the precept. Um, I just want to add one last thing is there is another paragraph in each of these precepts. And usually it kind of says something around the lines of uh, if you do this, you commit a really grave act and therefore this is the consequence that's going to happen. Um, so I've let I've deleted that part because it's very similar to uh, every single one of them basically says the same thing. There's a little tweaks here and there, which I'm going to mention whenever I want to get there. But this is the crux of what it's saying for each of the precepts. What you shouldn't do and what kind of attitude people that follow the precepts should have instead of doing this. So this is a structure for each of the 10 grave precepts. As for the second one, prohibition of stealing others' property. So you should not yourself steal, incite others to steal, or steal through deception. If you engage in the causes of stealing, the conditions of stealing, the planning of stealing, the act of stealing, stealing through magical spells and so on, up to the stealing of the property of spiritual beings or the property of thieves, no matter what object is stolen, whether a single blade of grass, I, I don't know why I put needed in there. I think that's a mistake on my part. A single blade of grass or you have stolen, even if you have stolen by accident. So again, any way you're connected to stealing in one way or form, even if it's through deceiving others, even if it's stealing from a thief, no matter what, don't steal. Instead, uh, bodhisattvas generate the Buddha nature mind of reverence and compassion, always ins insisting all people to bring about well-being and happiness. Prohibition of the heartless pursuit of lust. So you should not engage in lustful behavior, incite someone to engage in lustful behavior, or even indulge in unplanned lustful behavior with any women. You should avoid the cause of debauchery, the conditions of lustful behavior, the planning of lustful behavior, and the consummated act of lustful behavior. This includes everything up to sexual gratification with female animals, female celestials, or female spirits, as uh, as also entered as deviant forms of sexual conduct. There's an asterisk in the book that explains what it meant by deviant forms of sexual conduct, and there's a lot of different kind of hypotheses there. Generally speaking, it's kind of like you know things of like don't like uh, don't cheat, uh, don't engage in sexual ways and form that is like outside of what is perceived to be like normal or okay or something like that or you know don't cheat on people like these kinds of things eventually it also says stuff uh around for example like don't engage in any form of incest or these kind of things so that's kind of the kind of stuff that's meant by deviant form of sexual conduct and instead bodhisattva should give rise to an attitude of piety they should save all sentient beings by providing them with the pure teachings. Prohibition of intentional lying. If you engage in lying on your own, encourage others to lie or lie through deception, then you are involved in the causes of lying, the conditions of lying, the method of lying, and the act of lying. This also includes saying that one has seen what one has not seen, saying that you have not seen what you have seen, or implicitly lying through bodily actions, or even with one's own mind. So you should have clarity of mind enough to even not lie to yourself about some things, for example. So nothing to do with lying whatsoever. And instead of bodhisattvas, always give, uh, give right, give rise, I think, to the right speech and right views, and also lead all beings to practice right speech and right views. So again, it's not just about what you say, it's also about what you think. So you have to write, have the right thoughts, the right view, but also speak rightly. Prohibition of the sale of alcohol. So if you yourself sell alcohol or you engage others to do so, then herein are the causes of selling alcohol, the conditions of selling alcohol, etc. All kinds of alcohol should not be sold as consumption of alcohol leads to the commission of other crimes. So... That's uh, a point that a lot of people often talks about when you talk about comparing the Vinaya. So the traditional Vinaya cell, you should not drink at all. This one says you should not be engaged with anything that involves the selling of alcohol, but it doesn't say that you cannot drink it yourself. 
um, as long as you do it in moderation, uh, because doing so oftentimes leads to uh, other precepts being broken when people get too drunk. Instead, Bodhisattva should give rise to penetrating wisdom in all sentient being. I'm sorry, I'm realizing that I'm reading these, these slides that there's a lot of spelling mistakes, so please bear with me. Thank you. All right, number six, prohibition of speaking of the faults of others. So if you yourself speak about the faults of renunciant bodhisattvas, lay bodhisattvas, monks, nuns, or you encourage someone else to speak of their faults, then you have enacted the cause of fault finding, the conditions of fault finding, the method of fault finding, and the act of fault finding. So do not talk about the faults of others. No gossiping. When bodhisattvas hear about non-Buddhists or evil adherents of the two vehicles who talk about that within the Buddha Dharma, which is not the Dharma, and not the Vinaya, they should always be compassionate. They should teach these unwholesome adherents and cause them to give rise to wholesome faith in the great vehicles. So be compassionate. Don't talk about the faults of others. Instead, you should uh, instruct others in the Dharma uh, to help them alleviate suffering for themselves and for others. Prohibit prohibition of praising oneself and disparaging others. Is it disparaging or disparaging? I'm going to say disparaging. If with your own mouth you praise yourself and disparage others, or if you encourage people to praise themselves and disparage others, then you have the causes of disparagement of others, the condition of disparagement of others, etc. On behalf of sentient beings, bodhisattvas should receive their blame and reflect on their own wrongdoings and attribute good works to others. So similar to... What we see before, you don't, you know, blame other people for what's happening. Uh, but you should also be able to take, you know, like admit your wrongdoings, take responsibility for your actions, which is, you know, big karmically, take responsibility for your actions. And when other people are doing their thing, you should teach them, you know, maybe better ways to do things without faulting them. Uh, and don't disparage them, you know, don't and praise their good works at the same time. Number eight, prohibition of parsimony and abuse of others. So if you yourself are stingy or encourage others to be stingy, then you have carried out the, cause, the causes of parsimony, the conditions of parsimony, the methods of parsimony, and the act of parsimony. So instead, when seeing any destitute person begging for help, a bodhisattva should offer whatever that person needs. Number nine, Prohibition of holding resentment and not accepting apologies. So if you are hateful or encourage others to be hateful, then you have the causes of hatred, the conditions of hatred, the framework of hatred, and the activity of hatred. Instead, a bodhisattva should encourage the growth of wholesome roots in all sentient beings and without quarreling, always generate compassion. Like, you know, there's a buildup from the stuff we said earlier, right? Like you can see that people maybe have done faulty behaviors. Don't blame them for the faulty behaviors. Instead, you can use that as a teaching moment, use compassion, and don't hold resentment for people that have done so and say you should never reject apologies, especially an apology that, you know, comes from the heart and is sincere. Uh, you should always generate great compassion and try to avoid uh, quarreling, and that would help generate wholesome roots, not only in yourself, but also in others. And lastly, prohibition of denigration of the three treasures. So if you denigrate the three treasures, which is the Sangha, the Dharma, and the Buddha, or encourage others to denigrate them, then you have the causes of denigration, the conditions of denigration, the form of denigration, and the action of denigration. Instead, if a bodhisattva hears a non-Buddhist or an evil person uttering even a single word of denigration of the Buddha, it should feel to that bodhisattva as if 300 sharp spears were piercing his heart. How then could he himself slander the Buddha and not get rise to the mind of faith and a complacent attitude? So, these are the 10 major precepts. Now, you might be wondering... What happens if you break one of the 10 major precepts? Well, the Brahma Jala Sutra has an interesting response to that. So 
someone who violates these precepts will fail at attaining enlightenment in this life, will fail at being a good ruler, monk or nun, will fail at reaching the different bodhisattva stages, and will fall into the three evil realms of hell, hungry ghosts, or animals. And for a duration as long as two or three kalpaj, which is a really long time, he or she will not hear the name of his father, mother, or the three treasures. So very grave consequences. If you break uh, the 10 major precepts, you can let go of the idea of reaching enlightenment in this life, uh, at least for sure. But also you will be cut off from the Buddhist teachings for many, 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 many years in the future. So that is the response that is uh, put in the, in the sutra to, to that very important question. Now, with regards to the small precepts, uh, there's a lot of them. Uh, there's 48, and I'm not going to go through every single one of them. Uh, what I've decided to do instead is just kind of give a uh, a bit of a sample. And I'm just reading like the titles. I'm not going to read the description of it all. I'm just going to go through a bunch of them. Uh, the sample is purely arbitrary. I put some in there that are either um, like I know that are a bit more like contradictory and that might get on people's nerves or uh, I just thought they're more interesting. If you would have done this presentation, maybe you would have chosen different ones. Uh, so just take what I take these with a grain of salt. So some of the examples uh, do not disrespect your senior teachers. Um, do not drink alcohol. So earlier you, we had in the the major precept, do not sell alcohol, you know, or engage in activities that involves the selling of alcohol. But you can see that in the minor precepts, there is do not drink alcohol. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the minor precepts are kind of like, you know, you won't be caught into being stuck in the the, the three hopeful destinies for, you know, two or three kalpas if you break them. But the more of these you're able to follow, the the better, either in terms of speed or quality, your investment, your in your advancement on the bodhisattva's path is going to happen. So do not eat meat is one of them. Uh, do not miss a chance to attend Dharma lectures. So much in Sensei, you can use that against us when we can attend. Uh, do not care to fail for the ill. Do not amass weapons. Do not get involved in the trade and businesses that cause trouble for others. Do not fail to help both the living and the deceased. Do not be intolerant of the wrong wrongs done by others. Do not abandon the aspiration for enlightenment. Do not fail to make vows. Do not pursue personal gain. And do not intentionally break the holy precepts. So again, this is just a sample. Um, also, I just want to say as a little parenthesis that I put some pictures on, on the left of the slide. The pictures are not the, the Brahma Jala Sutra. They're just, I thought they looked beautiful, so I put them there, but they're not actual passages from the sutra. I just want to like say that in case someone is wondering. So now that we've talked about the precepts, you have an idea of what they're saying. Uh, I want to talk about what Asai has to say about the precepts. Um, so like I said, Esai in the Kozen Gogokuron actually had a lot to say about the precepts and why they're important. Uh, I've selected a few of these. I think I have maybe like six or seven quotes. Uh, some of them are, most of them are pretty short. So the first one says, according to the large vehicle, which is Mahayana, uh, when the heart rests, the precept originates and then one pointed concentration is attained. Another quote, by relying on these precepts, the incurrence of knowledge discernment, uh, like wisdom, that reaches multiple meditative concentration and extinguishes suffering is attained. So when you rely on these precepts, when you apply these precepts, you attain wisdom that allows you to kind of be in that meditative concentrating space, which extinguishes suffering. If pure precepts are non-existent, the origination of all various good merits is not attained. Based on this, this must be absolutely understood. The precepts of the dwelling place of supreme tranquility and merits. So tranquility of you know yourself, like peace of mind, the meditative space that you can get through uh, through the teachings, but also the merits refer to like the karmic consequences of your actions. So to receive the positive consequences of wholesome karma 
uh, you find that in uh, following the precepts. If you don't follow the precepts, you don't get any of this. Esai also mentions that even with dull capacities and shallow wisdom, if precepts observance is pure as such, clouds of karma will appropriately be eradicated and there will be a clear heart bright as the moon. So even for someone that is not well versed, that doesn't have that, that has not gained this tremendous bodhisattva like wisdom, doesn't have like a lot of like capacities, you know, from even if that's all the case, doesn't matter if you follow the precept with, with purity, which we're going to talk about a bit earlier, then the karma that you've inherited is going to dissipate and it will clear up your heart. Um, this one, it basically says the same thing. I honestly, I just put it in there because it quotes specifically the Mohotsukwan, which is the, you know, the text that Tsuyi wrote, which is a fourth patriarch of Tendai. So, you know, it talks about, uh, Esai refers to the fact that in this, it says something similar that if you, if the precepts are pure, so if you, if you follow the precepts with a good heart, then you have concentration or meditative state that is, you're going to attain that which is going to develop stillness as well as wisdom or insight. And as a result of acting the precepts with purity, uh, all of these good things are going to happen. So it, it's kind of like you want to have the meditative state. You want to have stillness in your heart. Well, it, it starts with the precepts first. And through the precepts, you get to develop into these other things as well. And lastly... If the precepts are impure, then one returns and lapses into the three awful destinies. One pointed concentration or knowledge, discernment, wisdom, the occurring of all of this is not attained. So as it was mentioned in the, you know, what happens if you don't follow the precepts? Well, you fall into the three awful destinies and all of the beautiful things that you can gain through Buddhism and through the, the Buddhist teaching is not going to be attained. So what can we get from Asai's insight on that topic? So purity is attained when a being is freed from the obstacle to the Buddhist paths. This is something that I I talk about almost in every single one of my presentation. So the obstacles are the three poisons, so desire, hatred, delusions, etc. So purity is attained when a being is freed from the obstacle to the path. And the precepts are a means to purify the heart which enables the cultivation of wisdom, insight, stillness, etc. And these are the things that need to be cultivated in order to attain enlightenment. So the precepts allow you to clear your heart and by having a clear, purified heart, you're able to cultivate these other things that are necessary for enlightenment. So the precepts are almost like a, a basis for everything, at least according to Asai. So we're getting towards the end of the presentation. So a little summary of what we'll discuss today. So Japanese Buddhism operates within a different set of precepts uh, than other Buddhist traditions who follow the traditional Vinaya. These precepts were adapted adapted based on the rise of Mahayana and in its implementation into East Asian culture more specifically. In total, there are 10 major precepts that we should aspire to follow out at all times and 48 minor ones that can help us advance more on the Bodhisattva path. The precepts are a means of helping beings purify their hearts of the three poisons from which suffering originates. So we have to keep in mind, like, you know, we talk about the three poisons. Why are the three poisons important? Because suffering exists because the three poisons are there clouding our hearts and therefore our actions and everything. Each time you choose to act following a precept, instead of acting out of a habit or preference, you help your heart or mind become clearer. On the other side, each time you choose not to follow a precept and act out of habit or preference, you either remain the same or you cloud your heart and mind even more. Now, the question that I think is going uh, on the lips of many people, are precepts still important to us in modern times? 
at least I'm going to answer this question based on partly my own thinking, but also relying a lot on what ASI was arguing uh, on the precepts and why they're important. So precepts are one of the many tools offered in Buddhism to help us get rid of suffering in a very practical way. So other means such as meditation, repentance, etc., it can benefit a person on their individual path. But precepts are geared towards helping oneself via alleviating the suffering of others. So when you act a precept that says, you know, like, do not kill, it's, yes, there's an individual part. You help yourself to purify your heart by not acting the precept. But at the same time, if you would have followed the precept and you would kill someone, you would generate suffering for others. So the precept is a very beautiful way of uh, you help yourself by making sure that you don't cause suffering for others. So the others also benefit from practicing precepts more than, for example, if you just do meditation on your own, uh, which benefits you, but that not necessarily have a very tangible impact on the direct suffering of another being. And this is a core aspect of the Bodhisattva path of Mahayana Buddhism, where alleviating the, suf alleviating the suffering of all being is the goal. Right. So in Mahayana Buddhism, the Bodhisattva is the ideal, and the Bodhisattva is one that chooses to remain in samsara in order to alleviate the suffering of all beings. It's not just about me getting enlightenment. Uh, you know, it's, it's like no, like this is not the goal. The goal is. I know I can get enlightenment, but everybody else needs to come along with me. So acting according to the precept follows that ideal of it's not just something you do for yourself, but it's something that also gets to benefit others. And I think that's very much in alignment with the Bodhisattva path that is offered in Mahayana Buddhism specifically. And I think that, you know, precepts take us away from staying in our heads to make us embodied teachings in a very real way. So if you aspire to become a bodhisattva, better start acting like one. You know, you have to walk the talk. It's not just about reading books and knowing all that stuff in your head and regurgitating, you know, passages and quotes like I've done in this presentation. It's also about how do you go about walking the talk while following the precepts and as many as you can is actually a very good way of embodying the teaching. Move away from engaging with Buddhism in your head and really start doing it with your body through your actions. So this is the presentation for today. Uh, these are the sources that I've used for that presentation. As usual, I, I just uh, wink, wink a little plug to my dissertation right there for those who are interested, but also the quote from the Brahma, the Brahma's Net Sutra, which is the Brahma Jala Sutra um, from BDK. And I will now open it up for a question and comments on the topic of precepts. Thank you. Why don't we why don't we start with Ichishima Sensei? Do you have any comments or questions that you would like to make? Yeah, thank you very much. This is very important uh, to keep a precept, and uh, especially Saito, founder of Japanese Buddhism, really uh, paid attention to uh, build up the Mahayana Bodhisattva precepts instead of the uh, what shall I say minor precept given by a Ganjin area, but uh, I think Japan, I think uh, uh, Japanese people or from now on, they should follow 10 major precepts and 48 minor precepts, as you said. I think this is a really basic, and he uh, found the Saicho try to build up Eikayana precept center uh, at Mount Hie. But uh, um, it was very opposed by the uh, group of monastic affairs from Nara period, Nara people. And uh, so finally uh, realized right uh, after his death, uh, about a uh, week later. But according to recent uh, research, uh, that uh, his uh, petition to accept such a Mahayana precept at Mount Hie was uh, accepted by a government one day before his death. But a uh, <clears throat> week later, uh, publicized to public, uh, to many people. 
So it is, uh, anyway, foundation of Mahayana Japanese Buddhism uh, since that time on. And so Kamakura Buddhism or Japanese people, they follow more uh, easy way to follow uh, such major precept. And uh, it was very nice presentation. I'm really glad uh, to say thank you for your wonderful uh, researching. And especially Kozen Gokokuron by ASI. This is a great. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ichishima Sensei. Yep. Thank you, Sensei. Um, I just want to make a, a mention for people who don't know. Isai was the was the uh, purported founder of Rinzai Zen in Japan, and he remained a, a Tendai monk throughout his life. So people may or may not know know that. That's the position of, of uh, Isai, and uh, they it cannot be overstated the effect of the Brahmajala Sutra and the Bodhisattva vows in relation to the trajectory of Japanese Buddhism because through the Nara period, the Ritsu school was the Vinaya school and that school was responsible for maintaining the 250, I'm just going to round about the 250 um, precepts for men and the 320 approximately precepts for women. And so when Saicho had wanted to reform <coughs> the ordination platform, he introduced the 10 major and 48 minor precepts. And what's important about that is virtually all the Japanese schools then adopted that system after um, uh, Saicho did that. So that that's why you have Jukai as being the major um, ordination process within, within the two Zen schools, et cetera, et cetera. And to demonstrate how important it is even to this day, um, Koshin will be going to take the end on Jukai on Yezan next April. That's a two-day ceremony. In October. Uh, in October. I'm sorry. In October, that's a two-day ceremony that he'll be traveling to Japan for. We make it a, as one of the conditions by which, in addition to having taken them when one takes Tokido, one takes them again in the same facility in which Saicho um, had given them. So within Tendai especially, that's still considered a very, very powerful uh, uh, ceremony. And open it up to questions for other folks. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.